Hello. Welcome to another episode of Oral Surgery Journal Club. Today I have a really good article, a classic article to dive into. This article dates back to 1979. It's about the preauricular approach to the TMJ. It's written by Alkayat and Bramley. Those are probably pretty famous names that you may have heard, whether you've, you've seen this article before or in reference, because very frequently uh, when discussing this particular approach, a preauricular approach to access to the TMJ, their numbers that were published in this paper that we're about to discuss are very frequently referenced and they're utilized in what makes our surgery now safe. Um, a little background, so al Qayyat is uh, from University of Baghdad, he is from Iraq, and Bramley was an English oral surgeon. Um, back in 1979 when they published this paper, they talk about some of the background that there were various approaches utilized prior to them, and it was felt because of anatomical difficulties, as well as find, difficult finding a good cosmetic result, it was a particularly bloody area, and then of course there was always the risk of injury to the facial nerve, is what made multiple surgical approaches uh, um, attempted in prior to 1979, and while Kai and Bramley came to the scene, their goal was to try to make the safer more predictable and safer. So some of the various approaches used historically um, and I find this interesting just to see the names and the years because these are probably names that we are all very familiar with so Risden in 1938 and I have read this paper in the original and maybe we'll review that at a different time because it's really fascinating I love reading it in the original just to capture some of the the language um, um, some of the other approaches um, so again Risden talks about the preregular but really what he's known for is the submandibular and he modified the submandibular approach to make it a high submandibular and that's why we call it the Risden it's basically like a hybrid between a retromandibular and a submandibular um, other approaches and oral which is very frequently used intraoral by Keen that's a name that I'm sure we've all referenced Gillies went through this temporal incision that's another name that we're all familiar with so again historically it's nice just to see the progression of the approaches used. Um, and now Alkai and Bramley come and they were going to do a cadaver dissection to try to identify the facial nerve in relation to a bony landmark. And they had about 50, 50 cadaver, 56 facial halves, so about 100 sides. And they dissected the facial nerve and then they, they measured in relation to a bony landmark. What they used was the external auditory canal. And so here you see, this is the diagram showing you what their measurement was. It's from point C to point Z. Point C was this most anterior aspect of the bony external auditory canal, and point Z is where the facial nerve crosses over the zygomatic arch. Um, they, in addition to that, they also did two other measurements. One was from the inferior aspect of the bony external auditory canal to the bifurcation of the nerve, and one was from the postglenoid tubercle um, to the, where the bifurcation was. Those may also be referenced a little bit, um, not, not as essential, but still they all kind of came from this paper. All right, so then finally to results. And this is the part that you've definitely seen or, or heard before, but just looking at the original, I think you appreciate so much more. Uh, I'm going to emphasize the range. So let's start. So here's, they, 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 they plotted it on like a scattergram. And I really think this shows the full story more than just what you would get if you just read this in a more modern uh, textbook that may have referenced this number. Often they'll tell you that the mean was two millimeter, two centimeters. So two centimeters, we're now we're talking C to Z from the anterior aspect of the ear, the bony ear, until you get to where the nerve crosses the arch. That's C to Z. So the mean is two centimeters, but of course we don't necessarily care about the mean. More instructive would be the extremes. So the minimum in this case would be more instructive because we want to know how often, what's the earliest it could cross. So the earliest, the closest it can cross is 0.8 centimeters or eight millimeters. So eight millimeters from C, from the anterior aspect of the external auditory canal, um, Eight millimeters in front of that is the closest the nerve in, out of these 56 patients, or sorry, 56 cadavers, that's the earliest or the closest it could have crossed. Um, 
So that, that's where this number comes from. And you may have heard of those eight millimeter margin of safety, that as long as your incision is within eight, eight millimeters, then you should be safe. Um, and that is true, and that's, that's what our surgery today is largely based on. But I just want to also point out that the scattergram gives you a more full picture. I hope you can appreciate that this eight was kind of an anomaly. It was a fluke. It was an outlier. Whereas you see there are more of them are clustered, clustered around the mean or the mode around here, 1.6 or 1.8 millimeters. So more commonly, you, you know, we should always treat it as if it's eight millimeters away. But it's nice to know that even that was rare, that more, more often it was 1.2 millimeters or 1.6 millimeters. And sometimes it was even greater than two millimeters up until three or three and a half millimeters. So I think the scattergram gives a more full picture. And I think it's, it's always nice when we see such a classic number that's referenced so much to see the original. Um, we should just mention the other two points that he talked about. Um, one was from B to F, this is the bifurcation if you go straight down. And that mean, that mean, and this is quoted a lot, obviously this is between 1.5 and 2.8. And then the posterior glenoid fossa, not really as, as quoted as much, 2.4 to 3.5. All right, so um, that's really, now that's why this paper is quoted, but I just wanna you know, finish. Um, he also talks about, based on, based on this, what he would recommend as his approach based on these numbers. So this is why, this is the al Kayat incision that's often referenced. Um, and he talks about the different fascial layers, and this is really instrumental to any time you do a preauricular approach, um, whether it's endoral or just preauricular, which I think between those two, that's what most people use. Um, and knowing the fascial layers is very important. So the first fascial layer that you'll encounter just deep to the skin. So the first one, the very first one, that's typically called the temporoparietal fascia, but it has some other names, so it can be confusing. Sometimes it's called the superficial temporal fascia. I say that's confusing because the next fascial layer is the temporalis fascia. So I find it confusing to refer to one as a temporal fascia and then temporalis fascia. So, um, the way Ellis refers to it is um, temporal parietal fascia, and I think um, that helps me keep them straight. So the very first fascial layer that you'll approach is the temporal parietal fascia. Now that's just underneath the skin, and it's not, it's not a very distinct fascial plane, so sometimes you'll go right through it without even noticing it. The next fascial layer that you'll encounter underneath that, that's the temporalis fascia. Now the temporalis fascia, about two centimeters above the arch, it will actually split into a superficial and a, and a deep. And the superficial will insert on the lateral aspect of the arch. It's continuous with the periosteum. And the deep aspect will adhere to the medial aspect of the arch. Uh, and he has a nice diagram, which is gonna show right there. So if you follow right here, this is the temporalis fascia. Here's the superficial, here's the deep, and you see they both insert on the arch, one on the medial, one on the lateral aspect. And you see it was once one fascial plane and it split into two fascial planes. Um, but this is really, knowing this is very important. And then of course, uh, if you go even more superficial, you'll have the temporal parietal fascia. And then if you look at these dots, these dots represent the facial nerve. And the facial, the, the key here is that the facial nerve is super, is between the temporal parietal fascia and the, super, and the superficial temporalis fascia. So if you want to be safely avoid the nerve, if you go deep to this superficial temporal fascia and you get to this fat between the superficial and the deep temporalis fascia, if you get to this fat, then, and then you tunnel down to the arch, then you're safe. And there's another diagram showing that maneuver. Right here. So he shows you, you cut and you raise your flap. And right here, we incise through one fascial layer. We get to this fatty tissue and we work our way down to the malar arch. And by using this technique, within our flap will be safely the facial nerve. And that is the basis for this surgery, which is pretty commonly used. As far as I know, that's how everyone does it nowadays. Um, I do find their, the, the extent of their incision quite comical because that's quite a large incision. 
um, they called it, um, they said, when they described it, they said, the skin incision is question mark shaped. So I like that. That's pretty, pretty apt. It does look like a question mark, but it's, it's quite large. Um, I think most people don't do necessarily that large of an extension unless maybe you're doing a temporalis flap and you need access to all that, that temporalis. Otherwise, it's maybe a, a much smaller version of this question mark. But a lot of people, when they're doing the preauricular incision, are going to use both the, the numbers produced in this paper, which is the 8 millimeters of start and safety that we already talked about, as well as carefully knowing the fascial planes to how to ensure that the facial nerve stays within the flap. All right, that's it for this paper. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm sure this is something that, that you have heard in the past, and I hope this is illuminating. Uh, please feel free to leave any comments or questions. I'd love to hear your feedback, and I look forward to seeing you guys at the next one.